Amen. Amen. Would you rise with me? I'm going to read a portion of Scripture in Acts chapter 16. Acts 16, and I'm going to read just uh, six verses. Acts 16, 6 through 10. Actually, just five verses. Acts 16, 6 through 10. You would remember the context. There was a problem in the church, a problem whether we should add something more to faith in Christ in order to be saved, correct? And we understand that it's purely by the grace of God, through faith, that one can come to salvation in Jesus. No works, no added dimension, but pure faith. And there was a conflict between Paul and Barnabas because they wanted to do a second trip in their journey. And so Paul and Barnabas went in two teams, separate occasions, different teams. And now they are strengthening the churches with this letter saying that the gospel of Christ is purely by grace. And so we go to verse 6 of chapter 16. It goes like this. And they passed through the Phrygian and Galatian region, having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. And when they had come to Mysia, they were trying to go into Bithynia. And the Spirit of Jesus did not permit them. And passing by Mysia, they came down to Troas. And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A certain man of Macedonia was standing and appealing to him and saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. And when he had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go into Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. This is God's word. May he add his blessing upon its reading and application in our lives. Please be seated. A few days ago, we had brush fires again in Southern California, right? I mean, these were fires that were not really large in terms of area, but they were moving because of the winds. And so you could see them, patches of blazing fire all over the place, burning down buildings and even homes along its path, right? Firefighters could not contain them. In fact, all they did was simply stand there until the winds would stop. Because the winds are unstoppable, powerful and howling winds. It actually blew left and right, up and down. It was uncontrollable. Reminds me of Jesus' words about the wind. You remember in John 3, verse 8, before Nicodemus, that Pharisee, Jesus said to him about being born again these words, The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but do not know where it comes from and where it is going, and so is everyone who is born of the Spirit. It's like a wind. You don't know where it comes from. You don't know where it's blowing. In the New Testament, that Greek word translated spirit is the same word translated wind. It's one word, pneuma. Pneuma may mean spirit. It may mean breath. It may mean wind. And the Spirit of God is like a wind. And this morning, we're going to take a look at the Holy Spirit like a wind in our lives. And this is what I learn about this passage. You know, when we learn to hoist the sails of our hearts, like a ship, like a boat, when we learn to raise the sails of our hearts, the wind of the Holy Spirit will blow into those sails. And when He does blow into the sails of our hearts, the impossible means nothing. The possibilities become limitless. His mission gets done. And the church becomes stronger, and the church keeps moving forward. And so we see that at work in our passage this morning. A long passage because it has to do with Paul's visit to the province of Macedonia, the Macedonian call. But here's what I learned. Here's the first sermon because there's two this morning. But it's going to be quick. Here's the first lesson. There will be, when we allow the Holy Spirit to work in our lives, there will be... Three things that's going to happen in your life and mine. First, there will be fruit in your life. If you allow the Spirit to blow into the sail of your heart, there's going to be fruit in your life, like Galatians 5.22 says. But it's more than the fruit of the Holy Spirit in your life. It's going to be fruit of spiritual reproduction in your life. You're going to have children, sons and daughters in the faith. That's one fruit that will bear in your life. The second thing that happens is, with the fruit, there's going to be friction. Together with the fruit, there's going to be friction. 
In other words, many will oppose your message. Many will oppose Jesus Christ, not necessarily you, but they oppose your message. They oppose everything you stand for. They oppose Jesus Christ. And therefore, by merely sharing the gospel of Christ, there will be friction. There's going to be fruit. There's going to be friction. But there's a third thing we learn. That as we persevere where the Spirit blows, as we persevere where He wants us to go, a furthering of His mission occurs. That's the third thing. A furthering of what He wants to do. More places, more people, a great harvest. That is how the wind blows. Now, as we look into this Macedonian call, remember Macedonia is a province. It's a province back in the Roman Empire. That Macedonia is now part of Greece. It's not the northern Macedonia that we know today. But this is Macedonia is a province of Greece today. And this is the Macedonia that is the province of the whole Roman Empire during the time of Paul. Now you recognize they were in Antioch, right? Paul and Barnabas, they were in Antioch. They were fighting. And Paul said, we need to do a second trip. And in his first trip, they went as far as Galatia to Antioch in Pisidia. You'll see that over there. But that's what they plan to do. Just go back to those places in order to strengthen them, in order to deliver this letter about the purity of the gospel of grace. Second trip, but they had a fallout. One went south, Barnabas, went back to Cyprus, that island over there. And that's what he did together with Mark, John Mark. And Paul went north through Cilicia, the purple province that you see there. And so what happens here? It is at this place, Pisidian Antioch, which is probably the place that Paul actually takes the northern route instead of the western route to Asia because there is a roadblock. He's forbidden by the Holy Spirit. You remember I read that passage, right? He was forbidden to keep moving westward to Asia. Don't go to Asia. Asia back then is not the Asia we know today, by the way. We're not talking about the continent of Asia. We're talking of a province of Asia, which is in Turkey today. Does that make sense? So it's not the continent of Asia. It's just a piece of province in Turkey today. That is Asia. And Paul wanted to penetrate Asia westward. Holy Spirit said, don't go there. Right? And so with a roadblock... He detours to a northerly direction, and the Bible says they were trying to go to Bithynia, north. And the Spirit of Jesus did not permit them. And so again, the Holy Spirit said, no, don't do that. So now, they are forced to take a northwest trajectory, and they land in Troas, which is already now by the Aegean Sea. They're at the very limits of what is now the continent of Asia. And they are about to cross over to what we know now is continental Europe. And so back in those days, it was all just Roman Empire. There was no Asia continent. There was no European continent. Okay? We understand that. And so, it is right here in Troas that a certain man of Macedonia appeared in a vision, appealing to Paul, saying, come over to Macedonia and help us. Now, we understand that that help is not any kind of help. It is not financial help. It is not help build a building. It is actually spiritual help. Bring the gospel to us as well. That is what they concluded, right? They concluded that the help they needed was to bring the gospel of Christ to the province of Macedonia. And so, the province of Macedonia is actually the yellow one. And they go to that province. They cross the sea. And in Macedonia, there are three big cities. And that's what we're going to look at in our passage today. Three big cities in Macedonia. One, Philippi. You know Philippi? There's a letter to the Philippians, right? Philippi. The second is Thessalonica. Thessalonians, right? That's the second city. And the third is Berea. Berea, the city. Now, there's no letter to the Bereans. Only the two, right? Philippians and Thessalonians. Those are cities of Macedonia. And so the Macedonian vision had to do with these three cities that Paul and his team visited. Now what do we learn? Holy Spirit blocked Asia. Holy Spirit blocked Bithynia. And they allowed through the vision to go to Macedonia. And in Macedonia we see the fruit of their labor. 
Here's a point I want to make. When we follow the Holy Spirit, fruit will inevitably result. The fruit will issue in friction, but a furthering of God's plan is accomplished. That's the sermon this morning. We're ended. We're not. That's just the first sermon. We're going to the second. But that is the main idea. As we follow the spirit wind in our lives to blow into the sail of our hearts, he will actually take us to places you and I cannot even imagine. We can have visions, of course. We can have plans, of course. But we always lay that down before the Spirit of God because He has veto power over all of our plans. We yield to where He drives us, right? Okay, so as we follow the Spirit of God, He's going to lead us here in Macedonia. Three things to consider where the Spirit of God leads. And I would call these three things the stepping stones to a fruitful mission in Jesus Christ. He emphasizes in these three cities where the spirit wind blows, three major areas like stepping stones to have a successful fruit in our lives. And so this is the second sermon. What are those three stepping stones? The first is what I would call the spirit leads to an array of different audience backgrounds. Chapter 16, we begin with Philippi, the first city that they're actually able to visit. Of course, Paul's MO, right? Modus operandi in a new town is to visit what? The synagogue. the synagogue. That's what he does all the time in a new city. But guess what? In Philippi, there was no synagogue. In other words, there was not the quorum of 10 Jewish men to form a synagogue, which is Jewish law. They could not put up a synagogue because there were no 10 Jewish men committed enough to start a gathering of Jews. No synagogue. So where does he go? The second thing he goes to as a Jew is a place of prayer. You know what a place of prayer is? That's like a minor church, so to speak. But now it's filled with women. Because remember, the synagogue cannot have, it needs 10 men, not women, but 10 men, male. And so there might be 100 women, but they cannot form a synagogue under Jewish law. And so they only had a place of prayer. That's what they called it. And so that's where Paul and his team went, to the place of prayer. And there they found a woman. Touch point, number one. And here's where the Spirit takes this encounter. That woman is named Lydia. She's a businesswoman. A certain woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira. Remember that city? It's one of the seven churches in Asia. Right? Like the letters to Revelation. Seven churches of Revelation. Thyatira is one of them. So Lydia is from Thyatira in Asia, and so you would imagine from Asia in the west, she moves to Philippi east, right? So she's a businesswoman, a seller of purple fabrics, a worshiper of God who was listening to Paul. And so Paul was sharing, she was listening, and it says the Lord opened her heart to respond to the things spoken by Paul. So evidently Lydia was well-to-do. Thyatira, we know, is actually a thriving place for purple dye. Jubus. Purple dye. And so Lydia, thinking, man, this thing really is, is exploding in Thyatira. Might as well bring it to some other place where we can make more money. Right? And she brings it to Philippi. And her business is thriving. We know that because she had a big house. And she had a big household. And she could actually entertain the whole church that was planted in this endeavor. So we know that of Lydia. And so, when she heard the gospel, the Lord opened her heart. What do we learn there? Somebody needs to share the gospel, and when somebody shares the gospel, God is the one at work opening people's hearts. In other words, the opening of people's hearts comes by sharing of the gospel. The two always go together. There needs to be a sharing, and the Holy Spirit will open the heart. So, you see, even when your husband, even when your wife, even when your neighbor, your parents, your schoolmate, your office mate, they might have a hard heart, according to our own estimation. But the only way that that can change is when they hear the good news and the Lord works on their heart. 
Does that make sense? In other words, it is never a barrier simply by assuming, oh, he's got really a hard heart. In fact, that is premium to say that person needs to hear for the Spirit of God to work in the heart because the two go together. Does that make sense? And so the change of heart comes two ways. They need to hear and the Lord opens the heart. So Lydia and her household were all baptized. In other words, she believed. Lord opened her heart. She received the gospel, believed in Christ, got baptized, and she offered free lodging to Paul and his team. And so what's the next thing? In Philippi, Spirit's next assignment. And so remember, a businesswoman, female, right? Spirit's next assignment, a slave girl. It happened that as we were going to the place of prayer, a certain slave girl, having a spirit of divination, met us, who was bringing her masters much profit by fortune-telling. But Paul was greatly annoyed and turned and said, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out at that very moment. Now the story doesn't actually say that the she-slave became a believer. It doesn't say. But it is implied in the text. Why do we say that? Because every time Jesus himself exercises a demon in the Gospels, that person who now has been healed from demon possession comes to believe in Jesus Christ. And so it's fairly obvious that this slave girl also became a believer in Christ. So, this is double trouble for the masters of the slave girl, right? Double trouble. Why? Well, she doesn't do fortune telling anymore, which is the source of income for the masters. No more horoscopes. No more Ouija boards. No more tarot cards. No more looking at the stars. No more of that because no longer is she possessed by a spirit of divination. She's clean and free of that. And so no more money for the masters and no more slave for the masters. Double trouble. So what happens? Friction time. With that fruit is opposition. So the masters, what do they do? They drag Paul and Silas to the city center before the law enforcers. Now, it's a very clever thing what they did. When they brought them to the magistrates, that is the law enforcers, the judges, they brought them before them and they charged them because of their anger. You know, the real reason for charging them for their fury, the real reason is economic, right? But you see, they're clever. And they presented before the, the judges this legal charge against these movers in terms of what would appeal to Roman sensibilities. You know, feelings of anti-Semitism. These big Jews, that's what they say. These are Jews, you know, they're not like us. And we being Romans, they say, right? They are Jews, we are Romans. You know, racial pride. Partly anti-Semitism against the Jew. Partly racial pride, we being Romans. Not knowing that Paul was a Roman citizen himself. And we understand that story later on. But that's bigotry. And it appealed to Roman sensibilities. So instead of actually saying, we run out of business because of those guys, you're actually saying they're causing trouble to our city. And so they're tortured. They're thrown into prison. Their feet shackled, the story tells us. Now, follower of Christ, remember this. We always have a choice in the toughest moments of our lives. We always have a decision to make. We have a response to make in tough times. The most hopeless moments of our lives, we have decisions to make. We can sulk. We can cry. We can get bitter. We can ask what's wrong with this world. We can ask what's wrong with me. Or, we can rejoice in a God who's not finished with you. Because that's exactly what Paul and Silas do. Inside the inner prison, 
They were not sulking. They were not sad. They were not depressed. They were not complaining. What were they doing? They were singing praises to God. Can you imagine this? This is crazy, isn't it? They were rejoicing in the Lord even though they were shackled, even though they were desperate. God somehow could turn desperation into delight. In fact, those are the greatest moments before God. When we're able to transform those desperate moments into delightful moments before God. You see, He's not finished with you. There's a greater plan. And therefore, listen and wait expectantly of a better plan ahead of you. So the impossible gets done. And so what happens? After singing praises to God, there was a big earthquake. Shackles fall off. The cell doors fling wide open. And the Roman guard responsible for their captivity is now about to commit suicide. Why? Because that is his fate when his superiors understand in his watch they were able to escape. So why not just kill himself? He thought. So the movers, we understand, Paul and Silas, they actually did not escape. Right? They did not escape. They were right there where they were. Of course, the doors are open, cell doors. They were no longer in chains. Right? They were free to go if they wanted to, but they did not. They remained in the cell. So, we learned something about this. The miracle was actually not for their release. The miracle was not for their freedom. That miracle of an earthquake opening the doors unshackling them was for another reason and the reason is for the salvation of this Roman guard. You understand that? It wasn't for them to be released. It was for the Roman guard to be released from his sins when he encounters Jesus Christ. And so what do we see here? The miracle was to bring the jailer, the jailer to a point of need for him and his family to encounter the Lord Jesus Christ. And so it says here, after he brought them out, that is the jailer bringing Paul and Silas out of the cell, he actually said to them, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Point of need. Without the earthquake, without the unshackling of the fetters, without the cell door swinging wide open, this Roman jailer would not actually ask the question. But he was driven to that point by these circumstances in order for him to realize there's got to be more than just this physical universe. There's got to be more than what is visible. That there is something invisible. That there is something more to this life. There is God and God is a plan for me in this life. Somebody has got to think about the other. Somebody has got to focus the eyes, not just on this physical plane, but actually to realize there's another level, there's another plane, is the spiritual world. God wants us to see, with our eyes wide open, what He wants to do. And so what do we find out? They said, believe in the Lord Jesus, you and your household. They spoke the word of the Lord to him together with all who were in his house. And he brought them into his house, that is the jailer, brought Paul and Silas to his house, rejoiced greatly, having believed in God with his whole household. In other words, each individual family members heard the gospel. Each one believed. Each one got baptized. Wow. What's the Spirit saying with this Macedonian call on this second city? or the first city, Philippi. Reach everybody. Don't let barriers stop you. A businesswoman, a slave girl, a Roman jailer, don't let anything hinder you from bringing the gospel to somebody. You see, the gospel unites our diversities. Paul even said in Galatians 3, there is neither Jew nor Greek there is no Roman, there is no Filipino, there is no Korean, there is no American. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave or, nor free man. There is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Now, you might read that and say, there's no male and female? Oh, that's where it is, right? We can be transgender. 
There is no male and female. That's not what he means. Of course there's male and female. Of course there's Jew and Greek. Of course there's slave and free men. But what Paul is saying in the passage is this. What the gospel does is to eliminate barriers for the gospel. Just because they're women doesn't mean they cannot hear the gospel. Just because they're a businesswoman doesn't mean they cannot hear the gospel. Just because they're a slave, they cannot hear. Just because they are free, they cannot hear. Everybody needs to hear the gospel unites our diversities. We are all one in Christ Jesus. What are the barriers you see around you? Because that's the first stepping stone to sharing the gospel. Barriers are there not to block, but to overcome. And so when you see a barrier before somebody and you say, Man, how do I share the gospel with this guy? He looks really notorious. You know what I'm saying? I mean, he holds a gun right beside him. And so I'm not sure what's going to happen there. Think of the barrier as things overcome by the Spirit of God. And so the next thing we know, the movers are released and they move to the next city, which is? Hello? Thessalonica is the next city Paul visits. Now, Thessalonica is the capital city of Macedonia. Not Philippi. Thessalonica is the capital of the province of Macedonia. So where would Paul go first? Synagogue, right? Of course, he goes to the synagogue. And so, here you go. Pay attention to the ways Paul shared the gospel because I think this is the second stepping stone. So not only share the gospel to whoever, regardless of the barriers, share the gospel, secondly, using different methods of sharing the gospel. You see, the Spirit leaves an arsenal of evangelistic methods. The first thing Paul does, actually says, for three Sabbaths, Paul reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and giving evidence that the Christ had to suffer, rise again from the dead. Now that word reasoning, you might think, oh man, I'm not really good at logical thinking. You know, I'm not really good in argumentation and all that. But you know what that word really means in Greek? In fact, you can transliterate the Greek word and come up with an English word. You know what that Greek word is? Dialego dialogue Paul actually when he went there he wasn't like me simply proclaiming one way communication when he went there he actually was having a dialogue having a conversation sharing and maybe doing a Q&A he was presenting he was explaining he was giving evidence and so people were asking questions and he was trying to answer their questions as best he could and the evidence that he wanted to share with them is this, that the Christ had to suffer, rise again from the dead. Now, that's not a problem at first. Why? Because he's not talking of Jesus Christ yet. He's talking about the Messiah, the Christ, to the Jewish people. And so he was trying to somehow persuade them, looking at the scriptures, to think that, look, our Messiah, according to the Bible, it says this. If you read Isaiah 53, that Bible actually says that the Messiah is a suffering servant. You believe that? You agree with that? I mean, it says right here that he's a suffering servant. Okay, that's good. So he was giving evidence that the Messiah, the Jewish Messiah, would suffer. He would rise again through the scriptures. And so they probably said, okay, we can believe that. All right, you're a good Bible expositor. We can see that as a Jew, our Messiah will suffer, will die, he will rise again. Good. Interactive speech. A conversation about scriptures. Specifically about their Messiah. And so in that dialogue, he opens or reveals Messiah. Like a Bible study. Old Testament prophet. Etc. Etc. So, the next thing he does is this. Proclaiming. It says they're saying, this Jesus. Ah, suddenly there's a change. Now, remember Jesus. So he's not necessarily saying anything yet. But do you remember? Have you heard about this Jesus? Of course, he, he's in Macedonia. What happened to Jesus is in Judea. Of course, it's all part of the Roman Empire then. He said, did you hear about Jesus? Remember Jesus? Did you hear about that? Well, saying, this Jesus, he probably talked about Jesus, his life, what Jesus did. 
his resurrection. He probably spoke about that and he says, this Jesus, whom now see the word is proclaiming to you, is the Christ. Now proclamation is like what I'm doing now. No more room for anybody to say anything, but you can say something. But he was publicly proclaiming Jesus is the one who is the Christ. You know what I'm saying? And so they might believe, okay, our Messiah, he's going to suffer and die, rise again. Then he began to talk about Jesus, his life, his teachings, miracles, that he suffered, that he died, that he rose again. And then he said, this Jesus is the Christ. Some of them were persuaded, joined Paul and Silas, along with a great multitude of the God-fearing Greeks and the number of the leading women. There's so many things I want to say, but my time is limited. You see, most, if not all, most probably agreed and loved Paul's message. But now, publicly proclaiming, as in a sermon monologue, this Messiah is none other than Jesus himself. Jesus is the one you've been waiting. Jesus is the one you've been hoping. Jesus is the one who would be the Lord and Savior of your life. Not all believed. But some did. Some did. You see, you see how he shares? He simply says, our Christ, our Messiah is like this according to Scripture. Now, there's somebody who claims to be the Christ, this Jesus. And I'll tell you about him. And then later on, this Jesus is that Messiah. And I proclaim to you right now, there is no salvation in any other name, but in Jesus alone, by faith, by His grace. Proclamation, right? And so there's various ways of sharing the good news. It just depends on what your audience is like. There's actually one more method, which is perhaps the most effective, but most challenging. And it's not in our text this morning, but you'll find it in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. Because right now he's in Thessalonica, but later on he'll depart and he's going to write to the Thessalonians who become followers of Christ. And he says this, looking back, chapter 2, verse 8 of 1 Thessalonians, imparting. This is what he did. Having thus a fond affection for you, we were well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives. And that word imparting is simply this. What do you have? Give. As simple as that. Share what you have. Share what you possess. That's imparting. But more than simply information concerning the gospel, this is how to make the gospel truly effectual. He shared his own life. That's an investment. And that's probably not everybody can do. I can share you information. I can share you a gospel track. But I'm not willing to share two hours of my life every week with you. And that's why many people quit the faith and they say, this is nothing, this is not real. This is all information. It's not really transforming. Because there's not a willingness to share my life, an investment of time and energy, sacrifice, to make disciples. Because that's what it is. And so the embodiment of the gospel is belief and behavior, and it shows in the investment of our own lives over other people. Evangelism becomes discipleship. But let me say this to all of us this morning. Because more often than not, the Spirit of God brings someone to faith. Listen to this. More often than not, the Holy Spirit will bring somebody to faith in Jesus Christ through an individual like you, like you, like you, like you, all of you. Then he does more than a preacher like me. Now when I proclaim the gospel, some might raise hands, sure. But the effectiveness of coming to faith in Christ and latching into the faith actually happens more effectively one on one. Not one among many. That's why Jesus made disciples. 
And that is why we need to make disciples. And so, sharing the faith. In order for people to latch on to the faith, to stick, those who truly are involved in the dialogue more than a monologue. We know why? Because in a monologue, you can't respond. You're simply forced to listen and somehow swallow what this guy is saying down your throat. But when it's a dialogue, you can ask their questions. And therefore, their questions are answered in a way that makes sense to them. So I don't know all your questions. In fact, I don't want to know all your questions because I know I can't answer them. But you see, the Spirit uses both. You, when you talk to your spouse, you, when you share the gospel to your children, you, when you share your faith to your parents, you, when you knock on the door of your neighbor and says, here's some cake I baked for you, and by the way, I want to share with you something that's really important to me. Do you have five minutes of your time? You who are so close to your colleague in the office. You who bring out your classmate every Friday night to go somewhere. You are the most effective one who can actually bring the gospel of Christ to somebody. And unless you do it, the Spirit of God can't open the heart because they need to hear what that gospel is all about. Now we can bring people to church and that's all we need to do, right? Who's your one? Bring to church. And that's a good thing. Keep on doing that. Because we need both. We need you one-on-one. -on -one. We need some of us, many. But you see, the Spirit uses both. And that's the point. Both. A few can preach, but a lot more can share. And the Spirit leaves us with a load of evangelistic methods for different kinds of audiences. So here again, fruit issues and friction. And the movers move to the next city because of friction. And what's the next city? Berea. Into the synagogue, right? Into the synagogue. And as usual, Paul is invited to speak in the synagogue. He used to be a Pharisee, remember? So what would the Spirit emphasize in this encounter? So in the first encounter in Philippi, the three people, what does the Spirit say? You have an array of audience backgrounds. Reach them all. Second, in Thessalonica, what does the Spirit say? I leave to you a plethora, an abundance of different styles to share the gospel. But here, what does He teach us in Berea? Well, I think it's simply this. The Spirit looks for attitude to sacred scriptures. What are people's attitude to the Word of God? That's important. You see, what happens here in Berea is this. The Bereans, these were more noble-minded than those in Thessalonica. In other words, they were more open-minded. They were Jews, but their minds were open. They were not closed, like a Pharisee maybe, but they were open to listen to anything that is in Scripture. And the way they welcomed the message showed their minds were open. They were not hostile. They were not threatened by the Word of God. In fact, the opposite is quite true. They had a passionate eagerness to hear the word. They received the word with great eagerness. You know that word, great eagerness? It's to be very passionate about something. That's why they're so eager. It's a passionate desire to hear and receive the word. And so they were like seekers for the truth. They know the word is there. Maybe they're not as deep a reader that they were before. They follow it, you know, left and right, but not fully. They understand there's a Messiah, but they don't know who that is. And so it's there for them. They're open about it. They're not closed. But in their passion for the Word, they were listening to Paul on a, what, daily basis. Incredible, isn't it? Daily basis, they were listening and checking their Bibles to see the veracity, the truthfulness, and the accuracy of the message of Paul daily. In other words, Paul was sharing daily, not just on the Sabbath when the synagogue met together, right? Daily, daily they were checking and they were very thorough in the way they checked, examining the scriptures daily to see whether these things were so. You see, what the Spirit tells us today is this, when we share the gospel, look for people who are open 
concerning the truth, concerning their attitude towards the Bible, the sacred scriptures. What's their attitude towards the Word of God? And you know right away how the response will be, but you keep on going, right? Attitude. That's what the Spirit wants us to hear this morning. Where's the Spirit of Jesus bringing our heart's attention to? What are those stepping stones for the gospel? Don't go there, don't go there, go here. In fact, cross over, further away. You see, when you follow the Holy Spirit blowing into the sail of your heart, He brings you further. There's going to be fruit, there's going to be friction, but He teaches us along the way. These are the things you look forward to. When you move forward as a church, these are the things you look at. Number one, the first of all, look at various backgrounds around you. No one is outside the love of Christ. No one is outside his desire to be saved. Everybody he wants to save. And so everybody, whether they're businesswomen, they're slaves, free or not, male or female, reach them all. We're one in Christ Jesus when we believe in Christ. That's the first. The second fruit is this. Look for, right? He says, look for the right style of sharing the gospel. Now, let me say this. You need at least to learn one very well. There's many, but you need to learn one so well. And so attend next week's and the next week's training so that you might know one, at least one, right? Yeah. Amen. Now, that's just an advertisement. Now, continuing on. And so you need to learn one. There's plenty of styles. Impart your own life. But here's the third, of course, this one. Look for the attitudes concerning the Word of God. If they're open to the Word, go right in front of it. Go for the dagger, as they say. Because that guy is a seeker. That guy is a seeker. So, what does the Spirit do when you raise the sail of your heart? Some things that you deem impossible in your life right now. Some things you'll probably say, that'll never happen to my life. Well, guess what? That's exactly what he wants you to think and to overcome. Because he's going to do something special to your life if you raise the sail of your heart. Now, what does that mean? Well, it's easy to say, raise the sail of your heart. But what does that mean? Right? I mean, I don't have a sail in my heart. What does that mean? Well, let me tell you a story first. I'll explain what it means. Years ago, while we were living in Singapore, we felt a tug in our hearts to say, you know, God wants us to reach a Muslim. It's probably going to be difficult in Singapore because of religious tolerance. But maybe we should do something. Maybe we should take a ferry to the next island, which is already Indonesia, and there just start something. Maybe we can go over there and visit orphans. And we did. We visited orphans, a Muslim orphanage. We ministered to them. We played soccer with them. They love soccer over there, not so much basketball. And so we sang some songs. We taught them some English. We taught them computers and all that. And then suddenly we had a building that was given to us for free where we can put up a lab of computers and a room for teaching people to play a guitar, a piano, and all that. And we had medical rooms in there. If someone was sick, there was medicine to be used. And so suddenly we had this thriving thing, a non-government agency moving around, and children were coming and flocking. Until one day we said, well, is this all that God wants us to do? Well, we said, reaching a Muslim. Well, this was all part of it, doing good things, the gospel in word and deed, but suddenly we hear about a story of a Muslim woman who had a vision and this Muslim woman was married to a, former, to a Catholic man and they kept those religions separate. She retained her Muslim identity, he retained his Catholic identity, they were married, they had children, half of the children were Catholic, half became Muslim, so they kept it that way until he passed away and one night this Muslim by the name of Siti Siti actually had a dream of her husband, who was already dead. And she interpreted the dream appearing before her, her husband, saying, Come unto me. Come to be like me. She interpreted that message as, Come to my faith. And in her mind, it was simply, How do I become a Christian? 
And so she went back to the Muslim school where she was teaching, and all her children were given scholarships to attend the school, and she went to the school and she said, I think I have to resign. And they said, why? Because I have to be a Christian. She was not even a Christian yet. But because I have to be a Christian, because I saw my husband. And when she did that, guess what? All her children were expelled from the school. Of course, she didn't have a job. Her children were now out of school. What did she do? But we hear about this woman through another person who now approaches me. And he said, can you do something about Siti? Why? Why me? I mean, there's so many Indonesian churches. Well, that's because there's a church right beside that school. She knocked on the door of that church. Pastor went out and the pastor said, oh, no, 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 no. I can't do anything about you. I'm right beside the Muslim school. They're going to kill me if I do anything with you. They know you. You become a Christian. You attend my church. We're dead. No. And so look farther away, Singapore. And so contact me. Can you do anything about this? And so we came to Indonesia, this island, brought Suzette with me, and Suzette shared the gospel to her. You see, openness already, but she still needed to hear the gospel in order to indeed have that transaction in her spirit. Now she is truly converted to Christ, believing in Christ. And then she was baptized, and I had the honor of baptizing. You know, the women do the hard work. The men just do the, you know, let's just go to the water, and there you go. But it's the women who shares. Men, step up. What's the point in all that? The point is this. For the Holy Spirit to blow in and direct your life where He wishes, you have to move forward by faith. Raising the sail of your heart simply means you've got to move forward. No matter how little that step is, you've got to move forward by faith. You see, Paul and his team just kept moving forward because they understood the call, the Great Commission. They just kept moving forward as little as they could, and as they did, the Spirit blew. Right? We've got to make this forward motion in our lives by faith. You see, He will not move. He will not steer your life without motion on your part. Have you tried turning the, the, the steering wheel of your vehicle when you're stationary? It's so difficult, isn't it? There's a lot of friction. But when you move a little bit, it's much easier to steer that wheel, right? It's the same with the Spirit of God. You've got to move forward a bit. That's raising the sail of your heart by faith. Move forward a bit and say, Holy Spirit, come blow your wind into my life and direct my life where you want to take it and I'm going to follow you. The Spirit wind is like an airplane. An airplane won't lift unless it moves and the Spirit lifts it up as it moves against that friction. When we obey God's call, when we obey the Spirit of God in your life, when we move forward in faith, the Holy Spirit will lift you, will direct you where He wants to take you. You want to do that? I want to do that. I'm not sure where it's going to take my life, but I am willing for Him to take the sail of my heart, bring it where He wants us to be. Now, what is that move forward movement? Maybe it's simply joining a prayer corner. Another ad. Maybe it's joining the training on sharing your faith next week. Maybe it's finally saying yes to an invitation to go through disciple making or join a small group. Maybe it's making the first move and seeking the forgiveness of a loved one. Maybe it's simply saying, Lord, I'm done with this sin. No more of it. I'm going to make the first move. Lord, blow your spirit with me. But whatever it is, you need to make that first move. You must hoist the sail of your heart and say, Lord, I am willing. Blow into this sail of mine. Take it where you want to bring it. So I don't know what kind of movement you need to make right now. You alone know that, and I won't tell you what that is. But if you want the Spirit of God to blow into your life and direct you like He's never done before, you've got to move. How matter how small a step it is. And what I'm going to do this morning is simple. If you want the Spirit to blow into your life, you made a decision to move forward on a certain something in your life. Lord, I'm going to do this. Small, take a small step. Lord, I'm going to do this. And I'm racing the sail of my heart. Blow into that wind. What I'm going to do is ask you to come forward right here. 
Because what I'm going to do is I'm just going to pray for you. That's all. But you're saying, Lord, I'm going to take that first step. Only I know what that is. But I'm going to raise that sail of my heart for your spirit to blow into. Take me where you want to take me. So you come forward. I'm going to pray for you while the music is playing. Would you do that? So I'm going to pray a little bit. As I pray, you can stand, come forward. I'm going to pray some more. Then we're going to end. Okay? Let's pray. Father, I thank you. Thank you for your word. Your spirit is a wind. He is alive. He quickens our spirits, our souls. He's the one who activates the sedentary spiritual life. And so, Lord, help us. Help us to take that first step of faith. Raising the sails of our heart for you to blow into. Lord, move in your people so that, Lord, they take that necessary step, no matter how small. Blow, Spirit of God. Blow into our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. If there's more of you who want to come forward, please do so. Come right now. Come closer. still come while I pray. Father, here are your children. Lord, by faith, they are saying in their heart before you, Lord, here's the first step I'm going to make. It might be small in your eyes, but nonetheless, they are steps of faith. And so, Lord, that is our way of hoisting the sail of our heart to you, Holy Spirit. And we pray that as we walk in faith, as we step out in faith, Lord, your Spirit will blow into our lives so that Spirit of God, you take us to places where we do not even imagine our plan. Lord, you're going to do a great, miraculous work in our lives. Lord, that the barriers in our lives will be overcome. Lord, that those deep sins in our lives will be taken away. Lord, that those insurmountable challenges we face each day, Lord, will mean nothing because now the Spirit of God blows into us. Oh Lord, we yield ourselves to your Spirit. Oh Lord, we ask that you fill us mightily with your Spirit. Oh Lord, we just ask that you give us the faith to believe that you will take us to places we've never been to in our spiritual life. And so, Lord, thank you for what you will do. We expect great miracles from you. We expect, Lord, that sins will be forgiven and overcome. We expect, Lord, that people will come to faith in Christ as we share the gospel. Because it is the power of God unto salvation for anyone who believes. Thank you, Lord, that there will be reconciliation at our homes. There will be reconciliation with our loved ones when we take a step of faith because your Spirit will move in our hearts. Oh Lord, do your work. We are here. We want to be your movers. Do miracles in our lives for the glory and honor of your Son's name. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. God bless you. Please go back to your seats.